Welcome everyone to the Start From Ground Zero Empowerment Summit. I am really excited to finally have this day here on a Friday night with all of you. Uh, this is gonna be an amazing event. Um, we have so much to cover and uh, looking forward to seeing all of you here. I know we have a lot of people coming into the Zoom room right now, so we're admitting them in as we speak. And we are officially live on Facebook Live uh, at the moment. So uh, feel free to share the Facebook link with all of your families, friends, and greater community. Uh, this is gonna be a great opportunity for all of us to uh, start just uh, building our way forward uh, within everything that's happening around the world right now. I think this is an op awesome opportunity for us to invest in ourselves and, and those that are around us. So really looking forward to this event. Uh, we'll open up shortly, uh, but before we do, just wanted to um, just provide a couple of um, some insight as far as what uh, we'll be kind of doing uh, this evening. So for those that aren't aware, uh, Start From Ground Zero is a community empowerment event series that offers tips and tools for better living through art, culture, and enterprise. Each speaker reveals how to start something from ground zero, uh, a deep look into the process and practical tools for improved living within financial literacy, tech, enterprise, brand building, health, and wellness. Our focus is to empower our community with education and access for all uh, through this particular pandemic with resources that can help us build our way forward from ground zero. So um, this is gonna be a great time where we all get a chance to learn from one another and, and go through um, an amazing event. Uh, this event is powered by Ground Zero Coffee, which is a coffee company uh, that a friend and I started about a month ago. And it was particularly for community impact. Uh, what Ground Zero Coffee is, it's an East African uh, coffee company, home delivery company and podcast service that provides um, community, that, that, that provides community impact through storytelling and social enterprise. So our goal is to use our enterprise as a way to impact our, the community that exists around us. And the Start From Ground Zero event series is, is, is an installation uh, for this initiative. So uh, really excited. This is our first Start From Ground Zero Empowerment Summit, and we have an all-star lineup that will be talking on many different subject matters. Uh, so uh, that's what will be happening tonight. Uh, this is about an hour and a half program, so we have a lot to get through in a short period of time. Um, if you're on Facebook Live right now, uh, feel free to start adding comments on this program throughout this event. We would love to hear from you and uh, all the great things that you are learning, so feel free to uh, share the link with your loved ones as well as hashtag uh, start from ground zero. That is the official hashtag for the event. So if you're tweeting, if you're on IG or Facebook Live, uh, feel free to share that on your platform so that we can be able to educate those all around us as we go through this program. Now, to give everyone an idea, we have a good group of people within the Zoom room. And if you are in the Zoom room, it's very important that you are on mute. Uh, the reason why is that we have um, some amazing speakers that have some important things to say. And, and we have to be mindful that if ever you are in the Zoom room, you are VIP and you have exclusive access right now, and we wanna make sure that access is done in a responsible way. So make sure that you are on mute right now. If you aren't on mute, mute yourself right now, and, um, and then so that we can be able to really hear everything that uh, each individual has to say. So uh, we'll have that going right there. So uh, that's really all the house rules that we have within the Zoom room. Other than that, let's all have a great time, and enjoy one another, build connections that we need, if you have questions, and this is huge, if you are watching you know, from your homes and you are listening to a speaker that is um, having, that, you, that you are drawing some questions from, be sure to hold on to those questions and um, actually comment. Comment those questions within the Facebook Live or in the Zoom room. And then from there, we'll fill those questions towards the end. So we can have a Q&A towards the end with all of the speakers and bring up your questions. So make sure that, you know, whatever questions you have, you're just commenting, and we'll be sure to um, bring it up as best as we can towards the end of the event. But once again, I am excited uh, for this event. Uh, we have a lot of great things to cover. I think we went over the overview of the program. Uh, we'll have guest speakers. Uh, we have um, a Q&A towards the end. And then, oh, one more thing. We also 
have a Ground Zero registration network form that is on our website at startfromgroundzero.com slash summit. And summit is spelled S-U-M-M-I-T as and you will scroll all the way down the website and then fill out your information. The reason why this is important is because we want this event to go beyond uh, our time together. We wanna to be able to nurture your curiosity and continue sparking your creativity. So we are going to um, kind of facilitate this conversation beyond this event. So make sure that you're registering as you can, actually do it now if you can, and uh, go to our website at startfromgroundzero.com slash summit uh, so that you can register and be a part of the Ground Zero family. And we'll have many more events to come and opportunities to connect um, you know, with um, a lot of the insights that you're getting from this particular event and moving forward. So I hope that you guys see this as more than an event. I hope you see this as a family and a community that wants to see you succeed in all that you do. I know life is tough right now, but uh, with, together we will get through this and, and really invest in one another. And, and so I think it's gonna be a great opportunity to do just that. So that is everything that I have for this event. This is the overview. This is our first event uh, where uh, this is the, and then we, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. We also have a special guest performance uh, with a music recording artist, Mayla. Uh, she's no stranger. I'm sure you have recognized her, I mean, and seen her music. But if you haven't, this is a great opportunity to learn uh, more about her, her story and her music. So I'm really excited about that. So stay tuned for the music performance in between the sessions and we'll have that going as well. So uh, a lot of good things, all good things will be happening tonight and it's gonna be a great event. Uh, so without further ado, let's kick things off. I believe we have everything ready to go. So we'll get to our first speaker of the evening. Now, our first speaker um, is Oin uh, Idogi. Oin is the voice blogger and brand curator of Sweet Like Oin based in Austin, Texas. As a traveler and lifestyle blogger, Oin is dedicated to creation, exploration, and inspiring individuals all across the world. Her mission is to share insights into her life and tools to improve everything from personal development to travel tips while maintaining the most authentic version of, her, of, of yourself. So please help me give a big warm welcome for Ms. Oin Idogi. And the crowd goes wild for yourself. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nate, for having me on. Um, and hello to everyone watching. I'm really, really excited to just, you know, jump into branding and what that looks like for me and what that could look like for you. Um, so I thought it'd be best to start out with what branding is exactly. Um, and don't mind me if I'm like looking at my notes. I have, you know, some bullet points written down and whatnot. Um, so. Branding to me is the process of creating a strong voice. Um, and I think that is very important if, or that is very important so that way you can, you know, see yourself as a brand, identify yourself as a brand. Um, I wanted to break everything down into like three different sections, three different important um, parts of branding from ground zero. So that's what the event is about. <laughs> Um, so I do want to share a little bit about myself. I know Nate, you know, gave me an introduction. Uh, for those of you, for those of you that don't know, I am the brand curator of Sweet Like Oi. Um, I'm very focused on helping others inspire um, a life that they love living. Now, when it comes to my social media and my brand, it's something that kind of just fell into my lap you can say. Um, I didn't have the traditional, um, the traditional intro into branding. Uh, I started off as an engineering major. That's what I went to school for. Um, I graduated and I found, my, I found myself dabbling into marketing, you know, got a little interested in that and just wanted to see what that was like. And then from getting into that marketing route, I started doing modeling. And I noticed that through my success in that realm, a lot of people started asking me questions. They were like, you know, how did you build your brand? And to me, I'm like, I didn't even know that I was, I didn't know that I was building a brand at all. I just was doing things that were normal to me. So the first step in building a brand is setting yourself apart. Now that 
is really important. You want to know who you are and you want to know what you have to bring to the table. So like I said earlier, I was doing modeling, but modeling wasn't my calling. I wanted to help people. I wanted to give back to those around me, or to those around me, and I wanted to inspire others. So from that aspect of modeling, I shifted to um, blogging because I felt like my voice and my story could be told. I'd be able to help more people. And through getting into blogging, I realized that I needed to aim for specific goals and small goals. That way I can know how I'm going to exactly set myself apart from others. You know, I wanted to be able to share all the information that I've learned and give it back. So that was the first. Um, the second is knowing your niche. Now this is really, 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 really important because you wanna be able to build your foundation in the right places. Um, with blogging, there's so many different like avenues you can take. You can do um, lifestyle blogging. You can be a travel blogger. You can be a food blogger, um, exercise, health and wellness. There's all these different avenues. And you really, really have to figure out what are things that you like to do and what is easy. Now, I don't say, I don't say easy like, um, I mean, it's not going to be all around easy. There, there is going to be, um, you know, some hard, hard things to do. But what comes easy? What are you passionate about? Like, if you are passionate about working out, then you should probably get into health and wellness. If you're passionate about sharing your everyday life, you should probably get into lifestyle. If you're passionate about exploring the world and seeing what you know the world has to offers and offer and like seeing new places, then you should probably get into travel blogging. Now, with all of that, it takes a lot of research. Uh, and that's something that I did. I am really, really big on Google. I'm big on YouTube. And I'm big on Pinterest. I feel like you can find all the resources that you need when you just, you know, do a quick search and see like, what is this? And don't be afraid to ask people as well. I think that um, one thing that holds us back from our personal brand and understanding and knowing our niche is that sometimes we are afraid to ask people for information. And I feel like the worst thing that someone can tell you is no. And if that person does tell you no, there's a million other people that are going to tell you yes or, you know, help you out, nurture you, give you the information that you need. So... I think that is very, very important. And another um, aspect to knowing your niche is, or for me, is picking a platform. I think that when we are in the process of branding ourselves and branding our likeliness and our, and our image, we tend to get really scatterbrained. We want to be on everything and, and we, want, we want the visibility. So when I first started, I spread myself so thin. I was doing Instagram. I was on Twitter. I was on YouTube. I was on all these different platforms. And I started to realize that my quality was suffering. You know, it's not always about how many places and how many platforms you can be on. It's really about putting the time and effort into your work. So my best advice is to focus on just one platform. And when you become a master of that platform, then you start spreading your wings and you start dabbling into other um, places. For me, like I said, I started off with my blog. I got so excited, I was so passionate. I was like, oh my gosh, you guys, I'm a blogger. You couldn't tell me anything. Like I got my website. I was, you know, putting out blog posts and I realized that my platform was really Instagram. That was where I was seeing like the most feedback from my audience. And that was where people, you know, were being drawn to me. So I just really, I just changed my game plan and started focusing mainly on Instagram. And from that focus, I was able to, you know, hone in on that platform and really let that platform grow. And now 
that it's growing, I've been able to branch off into other um, platforms. So I'm on Pinterest and I'm also on TikTok. If you guys are not on TikTok, <laughs> if y'all are not on TikTok, TikTok is really fun. Um, but yeah, you definitely want to just focus in on one and naturally and then let the rest grow. So my last branding tip from Ground Zero is developing your personality. Um, <clears throat> and I say this, I mean, from the beginning, you, you know, you have your personality, you already know the kind of um, brand you want, you already know the voice that you want to um, give off and portray. But I think that what a lot of people do is they forget who they are along the way. You know, like something that I always remind myself of is I still want to give off that same mission that I started with. So all of my content and everything that I do, all of my marketing, it always ties back to that one mission in some way, shape or form. I mean, it might look different along the way, but the core value and the core message is always going to be the same. Um, and it gets hard. I shared a really vulnerable moment um, a few days ago, or was it last week, on my social media that I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed um, with the growth of my social media. I mean, people start, you know, I started and I didn't expect to be where I am today. I didn't expect to, you know, be doing this full time, be doing my passion full time. But yeah, it's like really, really easy. Well, it was easy for me to get overwhelmed. And I really had to just take a step back because I, I felt like I was focusing on different things. Like um, I was focusing a lot on perfection. This is something that uh, people close to me, a lot of my friends and family, they've been like beating it into my head. They're like, boy, like you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have the perfect feed. You don't have to, you know, make the most stunning visuals. Like your voice is enough. Like whatever you put out is enough and people want to see the real you. They don't, I mean, the pretty stuff is nice. The aesthetics, nice, all that stuff, but you need to get back to the focus to the root. So I think that once you develop your personality, um, make sure that you're staying consistent with your voice and just maintaining that, um, you will definitely be set to go with branding. So those are my three topics covering branding from ground zero. And thank you guys so much. If you have questions, like Nate said, please leave them um in the chat and then i'll i can go deeper into anything so thank you once again thank you so much oin that was amazing uh we appreciate we really appreciate your work and all that you do um so and this is huge to kind of kick things off with branding from ground zero with you and uh, keep up those TikTok videos because they are entertaining and you provide so much great education with that uh, with your dance moves and then with the education. I love that. So I love how you merge education and entertainment. So um, love what you do. Um, so coming up next, I hope you guys really enjoyed that. Once again, if you have any questions in regards to branding from Ground Zero from Oin, uh, anything that she said, it, uh, said in particular, feel free to ask those questions within Facebook or within the Zoom comment uh, section if you're in the Zoom room. Uh, so we'll try to answer it towards the end. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Again, feel free to share all the great uh, tips and tools that you're receiving through these sessions online, whether it's on Twitter, uh, Instagram, or Facebook with the hashtag start from ground zero. We want to make sure that uh, this education gets uh, around to all uh, as much as we can. So make sure you're sharing all the different things. Feel free to take screenshots. I know this is um, important for us to really uh, broaden the, um, the visibility for an event like this. So coming up next, 
I'm really excited about this individual, a good personal friend of mine. Uh, it's uh, Ralph Jean Noel. Ralph is a first generation Haitian American who has devoted his career to helping people connect the dots between their God given purpose and the, the resources support they need to turn dreams into reality. He's had a multidisciplinary education and career working at the intersection of technology, entrepreneurship, and empowerment. Currently, he works at Facebook, where he helps lead a program called Elevate. Facebook Elevate is a community and learning platform dedicated to accelerating the growth of businesses, organizations, and creators of color. Prior to his role, he spent three years at Facebook consulting global restaurant and e-commerce businesses on their Facebook digital marketing strategies to amplify and grow their brands. Ralph holds a degree from Lehigh University and in Global Africana Studies with a focus in entrepreneurship. He's originally from West Orange, New Jersey, and resides in Austin, Texas. Always an advocate for personal development, Ralph is a teacher, coach, and mentor to both people and businesses who need the tools, skill sets, and mindsets to thrive. Please help me give a, a big warm welcome for Mr. Ralph Jean Noel. Hey, hey. <laughs> thank you so much, Nate. Um, appreciate it and just want to say hello and what's up to everybody. Um, when you read that bio, it makes me sound so official. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you for having me, for, for doing this. Um, I know that this is going to be so impactful, especially during this time. Um, so just to kind of give, I mean, Nate really covered my bio, but to give everyone a bit of background as to why I'm specifically here, um, to talk about just career building and um, starting from ground zero, especially during this time. Um, I just want to recognize that this is new territory for all of us. This is something that we are going through for the first time. We don't know uh, what normal is going to look like after this. Um, and specifically as it relates to our career, a lot of us are in different places, right? We're either looking to make a pivot. We're either just now graduating college and looking to get into the job market right now. Um, you know, we may have been furloughed, laid off, and having to look for other opportunities as well, too. So want to acknowledge that that's a very real reality. So uh, my goal today is to just make sure that I share uh, some tidbits, tips, tricks, best practices um, as to what you can do as you're going on your career search and your career journey, no matter what your goal is. Um, a lot of it coming from my mistakes. So five years ago this week, I actually graduated from college and I walked across the stage without a clue in the world about what I wanted to do. I had not had one job application submitted. I thought I wanted to go to grad school. I didn't have the GRE book. I didn't even like register to take the test. I barely had like any clue what was coming next. And I just remember feeling super overwhelmed. All I knew was I didn't want to go home to my parents. I really did not want to deal with, you know, hearing anything and feeling like a failure. Like I came back with like nothing prepared. Like after I spent four years chasing this degree, Sally Mae was about to start knocking on my door in six months. And I needed to make sure that those payments were ready to go. Um, and I wanted to do something. Uh, so, Truly, it honestly took me about three to four months of just searching to actually get my first offer. And that took a lot of time, energy, strategy, mentorship. Um, and it involved me taking risks as well, too. Um, but honestly, I really couldn't have gotten to where I am today in my career had it not been for the village and the, the mentorship um, and the love and the family and the people who poured into me and who pointed me in the right direction. So my goal today is to just share a lot of the game and the wisdom that people have passed down onto me. Um, so out of my talk today, I'm going to go over just, I would say like four points, four main points, key takeaways, skill sets, mindsets that you guys can really leverage as you go about your job search, whether or not you're starting, you know, from ground zero, kind of fresh out of school, looking for a new job, or you're really looking to make a new pivot, a, a career pivot. Um, so first one that I'm going to start with is um, really kind of going on in the root of things. And it's going to repeat some of the stuff that Orion talked about. Um, but one, really starting with your why. Uh, so I'm gonna start off with a quote from Simon Sinek. He said in his TED talk, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So Simon Sinek, he's a leadership expert. He really talks about this concept of the golden circle where why is in the middle and then there's the how and the what. And so often we focus on the job that we wanna do, which is the what and the how, um, but we really need to start focusing on the why because the why is the thread behind everything that we do. Um, when we focus on the problems that we want to solve, when we focus on why we're actually doing something, um, it really opens up the gamut for the jobs that we can go for. And it also helps us tell a really strong story 
and effectively communicate our skill sets and value adds to the job that we're actually applying for or interested in going for as well. Um, so as for me, kind of like a, a relevant story, uh, last year, Nate mentioned that I just started this job in tech empowerment, really kind of working on this program called Facebook Elevate. Um, I knew I wanted to do this last year at this time. Job didn't even exist yet. And I was actually on the job hunt internally searching for just other roles, just looking for my next gig. Um, and a mentor of mine really challenged me to think differently. And she asked me to start looking at problems that I wanted to solve around me and the people that I wanted to serve, because that would help me start to identify the why behind what I was doing or what I wanted to do. And that actually opened the door for me to look at different jobs instead of just looking and pinpointing and say, if I don't hit this one target, then like I missed my mark, right? Because we're not always going to be perfect. We're not always going to get the exact things that we want. But if we actually focus on what we want to, on, on the problems that we want to solve and the people that we want to serve, it'll actually help us get closer to the why. Uh, so discovering your why is a process that takes a very long time and i know uh, a lot of folks who are going to speak can also like say that as well too and it's something that evolves um for me i can state that my why is to motivate and encourage the human spirit and that's something that took me nearly 25 years to actually come to understand and uncover so for those of you who kind of like are in the different stages of really trying to understand and uncover that i just want to leave you with some best practices that you can do to try to start to uncover your why um, so the first thing that I would recommend trying is starting out with uh, a pros and cons list of what you're currently doing, right, within your current job. So kind of write down what are the pros and cons of what you're doing, what do you like about your job, and what do you dislike, and take some time to actually write it out. So studies show that you're actually seven more, you're actually seven times more likely to remember something when you write it down, and when you write things down and when you write your vision, you're more likely to remember it and to apply it. So this will actually kind of just force you to pay attention to those things. Even if that list is not perfect the first time that you get it, you can always come back and write it and give yourself a couple of days to kind of pay attention to those things. The second thing that I'll also do that I did as well that was super helpful was mapping out your career. So whether or not you know, you're just kind of graduating, mapping out your college career or you're an early career, mid-career professional, map out your career make a line kind of like a timeline and do a series of highs and lows and chart those moments out and then start to go back and kind of identify some patterns in that um, because you'll actually start to uncover and learn a lot about yourself what types of roles do you typically do what are some of the things that really gave you energy and made you happy what were some of your successes right what were some of the lows and you'll start to really kind of really identify patterns and in, in your thinking and your experience um, that can really add some clarity to your why and to some things that you're clearly passionate about and really help give you direction into where you want to go. Um, other things that I would also recommend doing, ask for feedback. Ask for feedback from your friends, from your family, from your colleagues, from your classmates. Ask them questions like, what do you think I'm really good at? What is one thing that you've noticed about me when you've worked with me? What value and specific contributions do you think that I bring to the team? I think a lot of the time we stay in our own heads and we can get in our own way that way. And I know for me personally, I need the, someone from the outside looking in to tell me, hey, Ralph, you're good at X, Y, Z, or you're actually really good at thinking about things from this perspective, or you have a really solid EQ. And sometimes these are things that you may not have noticed about yourself, but once someone kind of points that out to you, you'll be able to start to pay attention to a lot of those patterns and it will start to uncover some things for you as well. Um, the last tip I'm going to leave you with is really reflect and write about um, a couple of things. So what gives you energy? Um, write down when you find yourself in a state of flow. So when do you find yourself in a position where you just feel the most energized and the most productive? Um, what things are you working on? What problems are you passionate about? What people are you, are you willing to, are you like really passionate about serving? Um, and then what topics are you just genuinely curious about? and start to kind of pay attention and pinpoint those things out. And uh, the last thing that I would also say with this is uh, develop your own why statement and your own purpose statement. It's really important when it comes to crafting your story. It's, I can't underestimate how important it is. It's the thing that you're gonna start speaking and saying in interviews, you'll write in your cover letters when you have information on interviews and talk to people about why you want the job or why you want that opportunity really write that down and know it and make sure it's something that sticks make sure it's something that is genuine that's real that's authentic um, because people will buy into that so that's the first tip around kind of starting with your why
Second thing that I'm going to talk about is relationships. So really starting with who you know. So for me, in my five years, um, I've had, I want to say, four roles between two companies in the five years since I've graduated college. None of those roles did I submit a code application for. Every single job that I have gotten to date has been through someone that I know. My first job was through a college friend. Uh, my second role at that job was something that a mentor and a sponsor helped me come up with a proposal and we pitched and we created a new role within the company. My pivot to Facebook was from a friend who referred me to the role and coached me through the interview process. And then my current role is from a mentor and a sponsor who I worked with on the program, um, who sent the opportunity my way as well to an advocate for me. So it's really important, especially during this time in COVID where I know that everything is virtual and things are in flux. Um, that you really try to nurture the relationships that are important because those are the things that get you in the door, they get you up the ladder, and they help you thrive. You have to be really intentional with your relationships because you never know how they're gonna and how they're gonna help you and where they're gonna lead you down the line. So strategies just to kind of help you for relationship building, especially in the world that we live in today, definitely want to acknowledge that it's a lot different. For me, I did a lot of going to different conferences and events. Um, I did a lot of just kind of like in-person networking during that time as well too. I think now we do have the opportunity um, to do a lot of things virtually as well. So um, we'll talk through kind of some tools first. So the first set of tools that I'm gonna talk about are just different things that we have at our disposal that you could be using. So the first one's gonna be LinkedIn. And I think that that's kind of an obvious one, but a given one as well. LinkedIn for me was really instrumental in building relationships. Um, so doing things like sending out cold emails to people, asking your current LinkedIn connections for introductions to people that you two may be mutual friends with, right? Um, joining some of the professional or affinity groups as well within LinkedIn, just so you guys can uh, know each other. Changing your job status and filling out your profile just so recruiters know that they can find you. Right now, there are a lot of remote jobs. And what we know for a fact is that remote work is here and remote work is going to stay beyond COVID. So I think that that's actually going to open up even more opportunity beyond this reality as well, too, for that. So make sure that you're also tapping into those resources and just giving out the signals that you guys are open and looking for new opportunities and having conversations. Second piece is Facebook groups. Uh, so I'm actually a part of a few local here in Austin um, job groups and job boards as well. So when I was making my pivot to Facebook, um, they actually have a lot of really good resources. Find some of the professional groups within the city that you're in or the cities that you want to live in. Um, whether it's like tech or different industries as well to join them, introduce yourself, put your LinkedIn handles, and then make yourself available and open and state that kind of like in your introductory post, um, either for a phone call or for coffee, it can go a really long way. Those groups are really dope. And there are some really great moderators. I can't stress that enough. It's a really great way to just kind of get involved and get connected to learn what other opportunities are out there. The other things that I would also like recommend leveraging is just your school alumni network. So going back to your career services um, folks and having conversations with them, your alumni have a shared experience. They went to the same school with you. So you kind of all already have a connection and can start off on a great foot. So that's a new way to kind of break in and pivot to a new industry or just find out what opportunities are going on. And then virtual summits, um, similar to this one. So start from ground zero is a great place to start. But keep an eye out because a lot of these summits were formerly conferences that you used to have to pay a lot of money to get invited to or try to go to or have to fly to. And now they're accessible. So take advantage of them being accessible. Um, one great one that I would plug is Quarantine Con that I went to about a month and a half ago or two months ago, right when quarantine first started. Um, they recently had a job fair and they have just great random networking um, things going on as well, too. So these are great ways that you can also meet new people in different industries and start building those connections and those relationships. When it comes to the how to approach someone for building a relationship, I would just say really try to be authentic. Start small, pick one to two people per week and try not to overwhelm yourself because it can be a lot during this time. Um, find ways to just ask, you know, how they're doing, what things they're working on, how you can help, any perspective that you can offer. And then ask for what you need. Know what you ask before, before you get on the call and ask for what you need. Whether it's feedback, insight, ask for referrals, um, and then ask for coaching, coaching through the interview process. Like I said, I've had people, I think every one of my interviews over the last four years, I've had people coaching me through the process. Um, and then ask for that sponsorship and the advocacy um, for the people that you need as well too. Um, and then the last thing is just really when it comes to kind of this job search, I know that we are all in, in different places, um, but 
really making a plan and just kind of adding goals and kind of quantifying it, it can be really overwhelming. Job hunting is a job within itself. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of research. It takes a lot of energy. So something that I recommend doing that I did when I was actually making a career pivot, um, and I still try to keep a running list of this as well too, is make an Excel spreadsheet or even find a template online. There's actually one called My Job Search Tracker on the muse.com where you can keep track of the jobs that you apply for, the interviews that you have, and set goals for yourself. Set the number of jobs that you want to apply for in a week, whether it's three to five, right? How much time do you want to allocate each day or per week to this job search? What locations should you be looking at? Um, and then how many like coffee chats or informational interviews do you want to have? Uh, the second thing that I would also say is make sure that whenever you're applying for a job, really try to find someone that you know or someone that knows someone at that company that can introduce you start try to develop a relationship with someone there already who can give you the insight you're looking for you're not just trying to interview for that job like they're not just interviewing you you're also interviewing them to see if it's a good fit for you and if it's something that will fit within the direction of the career that you want to go into um, and then the last major piece of advice in this area is resume um, really really focus on tailoring your resume to the job that you're applying for I think that that is so important. What most, some people don't know is that a lot of these jobs actually use scanners. So they scan the resumes before they even send them to the recruiter and they're looking for keywords. So you can use something called jobscan.co, which actually allows you to test your resume um, with the job description and give you a match rate and a certain percentage. Definitely recommend leveraging those resources because it's really important and that'll actually help you get through the door. Um, Cause sometimes it's not that you're not getting any callbacks or any emails back. It's just that your resume probably just didn't fit the description. Um, but you have the skill set and you're qualified. I'm not saying lie and I'm not saying stretch the truth at all, but really just saying, just do your best to kind of tailor it to what you need. And a simple hack for me is keep a master resume with everything and then just copy and paste what you need so that you can tailor it to the job that you're going for. Um, and then I think, that's it for my main points. My last point is really just around taking care of yourself, guys. Um, you, if you can't be your best self for yourself, you're not going to be your best self for your other for others, and you're not going to be your best self for your job. Um, I, my correlation in my life, the biggest thing that I noticed was that I was in the deepest. I probably was in like therapy the most every around every job transition because it was always a significant moment in my life. So really make sure that you guys are taking care of yourself. Uh, making sure that you're in a healthy place. Um, otherwise, you're not going to show up well for that new job that you're going for. Um, and that's it on my end. Thank you so much, Ralph. Uh, that was super helpful, especially with what we're going through right now within the pandemic. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of uh, worries around what we are actually going back to. So I think there's a need um, you know, for us to be able to control what we control at this time and provide opportunities for us to figure out what does career coaching for us looks like right now. And I love how you talked about the why. Uh, one person did mention in the Facebook comments, I wanted to bring it up, it said, um, that's really great advice, figuring out what problem you want to solve. And this was Patricia Noel on Facebook. So people are commenting, people are really getting impacted by a lot of these uh, key tips and tools. So keep the comments coming in Facebook and, and in Zoom as well. And if, also if you have any questions, we'll answer it towards the end. Uh, so uh, that was extremely Ralph, extremely helpful, Ralph. So thank you once again. Um, so so far we've covered uh, two big topics. We covered branding from ground zero. Uh, we covered career coaching from ground zero, and now we are about to get into health and wellness from ground zero with Miss Rakima Parson. Now Rakima Parson is a Louisiana native, is actively involved in the Austin community. Rakima is a licensed professional counselor, registered play therapist, and owner and centered owner of Centered Counseling and Consulting, PLLC. Rakima uses her understanding of both trauma and culture to inform her work. She does not simply limit her expertise to the confines of an office, rather she actively seeks unique opportunities to share her voice and expertise to improve lives and systems. Rakima has provided many hours of free community outreach and is engaged in service on a statewide public policy committee, as well as two local nonprofit boards. Rakima not only believes that there is valuable work to be done, as, as well as uh, done through providing individual counseling, but she also embraces the responsibility of advocating and providing outreach in the community. 
Uh, please help me give a big warm welcome to Miss Makima Carson. So thank you so much for being on this program. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Happy Friday. <laughs> so I wanted to start off by giving a little background um, just about myself, because I think especially in communities of color, um, people assume when you talk health and wellness that maybe you're talking about this because it's something that came easy for you. This is something that, you know, you were just handed, right? Like you inherited health and wellness. Your family knew about it and you went into this arena. Um, my background is that I experienced childhood trauma. And so I had to build this and start this from ground zero for myself. So whenever I do presentations, I like to be transparent about that. Because again, I think in our community, we make assumptions about people who are sharing information um, and, and what they might already possess or what they inherited. And I just want to say that um, that wasn't the case for me. And that's a part of the reason that was my driver for going into this field um, was to share that you don't have to inherit wellness, you can build it, you can start it from ground zero. Um, so with that being said, I look at health and wellness as um, it's not a one size fits all, right? It's different for everybody. And one thing that I look at it like, especially because I'm a Louisiana girl, I'm from New Orleans. Um, so I want to talk about like a wellness gumbo, right? Thinking about gumbo, it's a dish that um, a lot of people enjoy where I'm from. And a lot of people make it differently. So depending on whose house you're at, they might put different things into their gumbo. Uh, the way my family makes gumbo is different from maybe how somebody in a different region or a different area of Louisiana makes gumbo, right? And so I want to encourage people to understand that when we talk about wellness and we talk about health, um, it's not a one size fits all. You got to look at it like whatever your favorite dish is, right? So for me, it's gumbo. Um, but for you, what's your favorite dish and how is it made differently from household to household, depending on what people like and what people don't like? Um, and don't look at this as a, I have to do it the way my family does it, or I have to do wellness the way I see people on the internet do it. You have to do what works well for you. So the first place to start would be starting with awareness, right? You got to figure out what areas of health, mental health, wellness, you want to improve or increase what areas you feel like are stagnant and what areas are just depleted altogether. So you have to start off being aware about those things. Um, one way to look at that, there's different buckets that I encourage people to look at when I'm working with them. Uh, the first one, take a look at your social bucket, right? Like how are your social needs being met? Um, I would be remiss if I didn't touch on social because right now we're dealing with what people call um, Social, social isolation or social distancing. And I like to look at it as um, it's something that we're doing, but we can still be social with each other, right? There's video, we have technology, there's ways to stay connected. So how, are, how is that social bucket or that bucket for connection being filled up? Um, as humans, we're wired for connection. So we want to make sure we fill that bucket. So look at that to see where you stand in that area. The next thing um, is emotional. So look at the emotional bucket. How are your emotional needs being met? What does that look like? Um, as a mental health professional, when I think about emotional or mental health, that may mean that you may have to take some time to get the thoughts out of your head and put them somewhere, right? I always keep a journal. I have so many journals. Um, but that might mean writing them down. Uh, that might look like affirmations that might look like Bible verses, right? It might look like different things that help to encourage you emotionally. Um, again, it just varies from person to person. Um, and then that might even mean therapy. And I love um, what Ralph said earlier, because I always share again, I like to be transparent in this community that I'm a therapist that has gone to therapy. I think most therapists should, right? So I encourage that and talk about that a lot because um, that's, that's vital. So if some of your emotional needs are not being met through things that you can do on your own, it's always a good idea to, um, to elicit support and elicit help from someone else. Um, the next piece is financial. Uh, looking at how your financial bucket is being filled up, what does that look like? Your physical. I like to talk about physical because I do a lot of work around the mind-body connection. And so really looking at ways that your physical health is impacting your mental health and your wellness or vice versa. Um, for some people, they may say, okay, I get the endorphins going and I run. I'm not a runner, I'm a walker. So at the end of my work day, after I see clients or do different things, I like to go do two to five miles. 
that may seem excessive, but I need to sweat. Uh, for me, it's very therapeutic and it's symbolic. You know, me being able to sweat is like, okay, I'm letting go of all the stuff that happens throughout the day to kind of turn a corner and start my evening, right? And kind of the detox of like anything that stressed me out today, I'm going to leave it outside um, and not bring it back into the house with me, right? Or by, and then looking at different ways. For some people, you may say, okay, mobility-wise, walking or running is not something that's a fit for me. What about a hula hoop, right? I'm also a play therapist and I'm not a play therapist just because I work with children. I use those techniques with adults as well. We have to remind ourselves to be playful, to have that spirit of play and making time for things that seem fun. So looking at ways that you within your resource can have physical activity um, and, and looking into that because that really does improve your wellness. Intellectual bucket. What does that look like? Do you feel intellectually stimulated? Are there areas of professional growth that you want to look into? Are there books that you want to read um, now that you have some downtime? How's that bucket looking? Um, and environmental is another bucket to look at for wellness. Um, what's your living environment like, right? If you're living in a situation that doesn't feel so healthy, that's one thing to consider. How can you make changes and make it a healthier environment? Um, if you're living in an environment and you're like, oh, I'm here alone during this social distancing period, what can you do to add to your house to spark joy? Um, are there plants, are there scents, are there things that you can help to have in your environment that helps to increase your mood? Um, again, you can get a lot of great tips about that off Pinterest and different places like that. So look into ways to spruce up your environment. Again, it doesn't have to be expensive, but look at ways that you can shift your environment so that that contributes to your wellness as well. And then the last one is spiritual. So looking at that, whatever that may be for, for who, wherever you are, like what do you do to kind of spark that? For some people that might be affirmations, for other people that might be inspiring quotes, for other people that could be Bible verses, right? So looking at what that looks like for you um, and make sure that you look at those buckets. Um, it's never gonna be 100% balanced. Like the idea of balance is, it's sometimes elusive, right? Like we can be in harmony, but we can't always have balance. And for some of us, we don't want those things to be equally balanced. Um, we want a little bit more. We might want more social in some seasons of our life than we care about the financial piece. And then there might be some seasons where it's all about like, I need to go 70% financial, you know, and kind of focus and, and shorten these other things. So just try to have them as balanced as is acceptable or appropriate for you um, and look at those buckets. The second thing, once you've looked at those buckets and you've gained awareness about where you stand, what buckets are not full enough, what buckets are too full, because that's the thing too, right? You might be too heavy in one of those areas and need to kind of scale it back. Um, set goals. That's the next big thing. Set a goal for yourself. I always encourage people to set manageable goals um, because self-care, this word self-care, you know, we always self-care Sunday, self-care Saturday. All these things, you know, can sometimes get stressful if you add things to your to-do list that feel like work and they don't feel joyful, they don't feel exciting for you. So make sure that you pick manageable goals, uh, manageable things that you can do to be well, um, and start small, right? If you load up your list, like you're going to be less likely to be successful at it, or if you miss something, you're going to get discouraged, you're going to say, wellness isn't for me, but wellness is for everybody. So pick small things that can, you know, you can create changes incrementally. Um, and then over time, it will, it will become a habit. Um, and then accountability goes along with that goal. Um, I am very transparent, right? I'm a person who, if, if I'm talking to people, like, and they ask me how I'm doing, I'm actually going to tell them <laughs> how I'm doing, uh, not some made up kind of scripted speech. So, you know, don't ask me if you don't really want to know, but um, I will, because I think it's important to have that level of transparency and it's based on your comfort level. So. You might not want to do that with everybody you meet, right? That, that opens you up. You're really vulnerable and you're sharing your goals, your wellness goals with everybody. But if you can identify at least one person in your circle that you feel like you can trust with that goal, um, I think accountability is important too. Uh, for people who say, you know what, I'm on this wellness journey and my family doesn't understand it, uh, then that might be a time where you say, you know what, I want to work with a counselor or a therapist and have them be my accountability uh, in this wellness journey that I'm on. The big takeaways I want people to, to think about for today um, is that wellness is not earned or deserved. Like, it's not like I'm going to work up this much or do this much this week, and then I'm going to deserve and earn some wellness, or I'm going to deserve to do some self-care. Um, that's actually counterproductive. So I encourage people to 
infuse something that they can do for wellness every day, right? If we stack up the stressors, we're going to be at our, at our boiling point, and that's not going to be good for anybody. We're going to have difficulty regulating. So you really want to infuse some sort of wellness coping strategy into your daily life um, so that you don't ever get to a point where you do boil over, right? You want to be, we want to be preventative. We don't want to be, we want to be as least reactive as possible. So if we increase these things over time, uh, it can help prevent that. Um, and the next thing I want people to know is that it doesn't have to be long. So you might say, okay, well, only certain people have this luxury of being able to have time to do self-care. Um, I want to dispel that as well. If you're doing this every day, it could be 10 minutes um, of something that you do for yourself that feels good and it, you know, gets things going for you and you start to feel better every day when you do that. So it's not something that you work your way up to earn and deserve. Everybody's entitled to wellness. Everybody's entitled to feeling good. Um, and it doesn't have to take a long time. And then the last big piece is that it doesn't have to be expensive. Um, it doesn't have to cost a lot of money, right? One thing you can do for self-care is breathing for 10 minutes, right? Like just sitting and breathing. Uh, one, again, I told y'all I work with all ages, but one cheap, easy thing is blowing bubbles, right? Like you can get some bubbles for cheap and just say, I'm going to blow these bubbles for 10 minutes, right? Because I need to remember to breathe. Um, I'm going to do something that sparks joy. If you like to dance, dance. If you want to sing, sing. Sing is actually really good for breathing. I don't sing very well, but I love to sing. That's a, that's a place where I'm not in flow, uh, but I love doing it and I sing often. Um, so it, it does help with regulating your breathing as well. Um, and then the last thing is, you know, in communities of color, just knowing that we do deserve to be well, we are entitled to wellness. It's a right. It, it's not something that you have to have a certain amount of money to have or be from a certain family to have. Um, it is something that you, you can have, but you have to cultivate it. You have to put some effort into it and you have to be accountable to it. Um, but don't let it stress you out. Start, you know, start where you are and give yourself grace. There's going to be days where you know, especially in our current situation, it might be hard to spend time doing these things. Give yourself grace on those days, but go back and remember, okay, these are things I want to work on and, and try to implement some different things that you can do. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rakima. That was so helpful. I appreciate the tips and tools. And I think, you know, many of us, is, it's important, I think what you said, that, you know, health and wellness is not just a luxury. It's something that we're entitled to. You know, it, it's something that is very important and something that we can, we have to be mindful of. And, you know, with what we're dealing with right now within the pandemic, I think it's um, interesting to what that looks like for each individual, where, you know, there's nothing that's just linear, but it's literally just finding out what best fits you. And I think your tips and tools can be best utilized in, in, in a diverse amount of ways with people that are dealing with different types of situations. And then we can kind of build on learning you know, with these practical tools. So thank you so much for sharing. We really do appreciate you. So coming up next, we, we've touched on quite a, a bit of, of topics so far from um, branding to career coaching to health and wellness. Uh, now uh, we have a couple more topics to, to touch on with creativity and financial literacy. But before we do that, uh, we have a treat for everyone. Uh, this is a special musical performance uh, in quarantine. So uh, feel free to vibe out, enjoy your time in your, in your homes. Uh, just take some time just to get with your families and enjoy some music. Uh, this person that we're bringing to the Zoom stage is Maylot. And Maylot is uh, born and bred in the live musical, musical capital of the world, Austin, Texas. She has played many of the festivals in her hometown, including the more notable South by Southwest and Austin City Limits Festival. Maylot premiered the video to the title track of her latest release, After All, with a Q&A on billboard.com. Maylot can also be found on invader.com, Austin American Statesman, The Austin Chronicle, OK Player, OK Africa, Afropunk, and many more. She has opened for the internet, Thundercat, Aluna George, and most recently completed her first solo tour. She also represented the USA by opening for Alo Black at the British Science Museum for Black's film premiere of America's musical journey from love, lust, uh, success to, to failure. Maylot sings of what it means to be a human being simply longing to be. Um, her song, Happy Hour, is simple, 
longing and about connecting despite isolation to someone distant uh, physically but not emotionally. It was recorded during quarantine with the intention of bringing a little hope and joy to the people during this crazy time. Please help me give a big warm welcome uh, for Maylab. Thanks, Nate. Um, yeah, well, first off, I just wanted to say how incredible this has been thus far. Um, I have been gaining a lot of insight, um, and it's a really great program. So thank you for not only having me, but uh, having this entire thing. So um, yeah, the song I'm going to play is Happy Hour, and it was written and recorded during quarantine. And um, you know, my why is to spread love as much as possible. So that's why I wrote it. So here it is. Pour me some white wine, you know I got time. It's five o'clock somewhere. Feel like I've lost my mind, nothing to do. Nowhere to go, nowhere. It's raining too, and I'm feeling blue. Meant so much, I wrote this song. I love talking with you. A hug could do me so much good, but this love is understood. One look can save you. Yeah, baby, how are you? I love you, you love me too. So maybe for a little while, before it goes out of style, I can talk with you. Happy hour, when I'm chilling with you. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Said it's a happy hour, or two, or two, when I'm chilling. Thank you. That was amazing. I love I love the song. And it's so the piano during quarantine. So you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. I love the piano play. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much Thanks for, for using me. this. Yeah. That was amazing. I hope you guys enjoyed that performance by Maylot. And if you want to actually Maylot, what is the best way that people can get to know more about you and your music and the new single? I have a listen to it. Uh, definitely through Instagram is where I'm most active. It's at Behold Maylot, um, M-E-L-A-T. And um, yeah, you can stream my music anywhere that you listen to music, whether it's Spotify, Apple Music, SoundCloud, YouTube, you name it, I'm there. So um, hope you guys enjoy. And that was happy hour. Thank you. Thank you. So um, wow, this has been a great program thus far. We've had great topics that have been spoken to and ways that we can kind of build on this education. Great entertainment as well, uh, thanks to Maylot. And then we have a couple more speakers, which I'm personally excited about. Uh, the next session we'll be talking about um, uh, kind of building our way forward with financial literacy. So financial literacy from ground zero is the, the concept and the idea of the talk. And I uh, just want to encourage, once again, everyone, if you get a chance, uh, if you know people that need to be in these type of sessions, Feel free to share right now. We are live on Facebook. We are live on Zoom. Uh, so please um, take screenshots, share the messages that you're hearing within this uh, program on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, whatever uh, social platforms that you're on and hashtag start from ground zero. Also feel free to go to the, the startfromgroundzero.com website 
um, and fill out the uh, Ground Zero Network registration form so that you can be more included and involved and more great things to come uh, beyond this event. And that's ground, uh, startfromgroundzero.com slash summit. And that's S-U-M-M-I-T. Scroll all the way down and then you can go ahead and fill out the uh, Ground Zero Network registration form. So, uh, wow, I'm really excited for the next two speakers. Um, the, the, the next speaker will be speaking on financial literacy from Ground Zero. Now, uh, Michael Underbrahan is an executive director at MSCI in San Francisco, where he works with investors across the U.S. He has experience in investing across the stocks, bonds, and other assets. He was born in Eritrea and grew up in Seattle. Please help me give a big, warm welcome for Mr. Michael Underbrahan. Hey, I appreciate it. Can you hear me? Perfect, perfect. Um, Mayla, you are a tough act to follow, but uh, I'm going to do my best. Um, you know, uh, this is, you know, I've, I've picked up quite a, quite a few um, tips from the other speakers as well. Uh, I just wanted to touch on a few things that, that folks had said. Uh, first, uh, Ralph mentioned the importance of LinkedIn. I could not agree more. Uh, the last two jobs I've gotten were both through LinkedIn. Uh, and just one piece of advice uh, on that is, is put a headshot. Uh, there are studies out there that show that the odds of getting, uh, you know, a response is much better if you have a, a headshot. So, you know, invest, you know, a little bit of time and uh, get a proper headshot and you'll, you know, you'll see some good returns. And then <clears throat> the other thing uh, I picked up, I didn't realize blowing bubbles was therapeutic. So I'm actually going to try to do that uh, <laughs> after the session, just make sure to social distance because I don't think people are want any bubbles around them these days. Um, and then lastly, I think based on the gram, it is uh, Rakima's fourth uh, four year anniversary. So congratulations to you. Um, so I'm just gonna hit on a few things on financial literacy. Um, I'm gonna keep it pretty short because uh, Nate and I actually had a podcast recently that uh, went a little deeper into the topics around financial literacy and uh, it's on his page, it's on my page. So uh, feel free to, to reach out and uh, you know, I think there's some some good points there that uh, we had discussed a few weeks ago, but uh, I think, you know, financial literacy to me is, is so important for our community because, um, you know, if we come from an immigrant household, financial literacy for me growing up was, you know, how much money do we have in the bank, right? Like it wasn't about building wealth. It wasn't about investing in markets. It was about surviving, you know, and that's, that's what our generations, um, you know, grew up on. And so for us, you know, being the first generation that are growing here, we have a real chance to, to change the narrative. And it's, it's no coincidence that other types of folks, whether it's, um, you know, white folks, Jewish, like they build wealth through generations and, you know, generations of wealth last a long time. And so for us, you know, we, we have to start from ground zero and that's, uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. So I'm just going to start with a, a quick quote. Um, you know, Ralph gave a, a pretty good quote from a, a TED talk. I'm actually going to quote Chris Rock from a, a special a couple of years ago, you know, he said something simple. He said, Shaq is rich, but the white man who signs his check is wealthy. I don't know if any of you remember that quote, but to me, that that's what's key is, uh, you know, building wealth means you're investing, you're not spending um, all of your money as, as it comes in, but you're, you know, spending uh, what's needed and then investing the, uh, the rest into uh, long-term uh, investments, whether it's retirement, whether it's for college, uh, whether it's for buying a house, and that's what builds that, that wealth uh, over generations. So the three thoughts I'm going to leave you with today, uh, the first is, um, uh, and this is something I did a few years ago, is I just put together what I call a personal balance sheet. So one of the first things you learn in, uh, in an accounting class or an economics class is the concept of a balance sheet, really meaning assets equals your liabilities, plus your equity. And so the key thing there is you want to build assets, but you want to build it in a way that does not uh, lead to very high levels of debt or liabilities. And then you end up with a negative net worth and a negative net worth over time can be extremely detrimental. And so, you know, I would encourage everyone to spend an hour, go through all of your finances, uh, meaning what are your assets? So things like cash you have in a checking account or savings account, any investments you have, you know, if it's in a retirement account, if it's in a stock fund, a bond fund, 
Uh, the value of your home, if you own a home, you know, that is, a, of course, a, uh, an asset. Uh, any other, uh, pro you know, personal property, if you have a car, you know, those are all assets. And of course, there's different types of assets. It's what's, there's what's called appreciating assets. An appreciating asset is something that grows over time. Think of your house. Think of investments and markets. And then depreciating assets like a car. You know, as soon as you buy that car, <laughs> the minute it goes off the lot, the value declines. So you want to make sure that you have a good balance of uh, appreciating versus depreciating assets. And then second, just go through your liabilities. You know, if, uh, liability is things like a mortgage that you have on the house, uh, car loans, student loans, uh, credit card balances. These are all liabilities uh, that need to be paid back over time. And of course, there's different types of debt. You know, student loan debt is not necessarily the worst thing when it comes to credit scores, for example, but credit card debt is, uh, can be very detrimental. And we'll speak about that in a, a minute here. So once you do that, you know, the difference is really your equity. And the, the goal is to really uh, make sure that you get to a positive net worth and then grow that net worth over time. And that's the wealth that can be passed on uh, to future generations, your family, your parents, uh, et cetera. So that's, uh, that's key. And you can do it, you know, you can do it old school. I do it in Excel. You have um, a lot of different apps out there. There's one called Personal Capital that actually does a really great job of just aggregating all of your expenses and your assets in different places and, and showing you your net worth. So, that is uh, step one is just keeping a, a very good personal balance sheet. Uh, the second is around uh, credit. So, uh, you know, we, uh, in our generation, you know, we want to keep it 100. I, I heard a, a, a great saying recently, which is keep it 700. 700 being that is pretty much the minimum credit score that you need in order to uh, gain good credit. Um, and so your main goal is to hit that score and maintain it. And, you know, the nice thing these days is that through regulation, you can actually get a free credit score every single year from the three providers. The three providers are Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. And they are obligated by law to give you one free credit score a year. So just pull that credit score. You know, first of all, make sure it's accurate. You know, I've, I've heard of stories of someone who had a $25, you know, Macy's card years ago and it sat on their credit for 10 years and that has a detrimental impact. It doesn't even matter the dollar amount. The fact that it sat there for so long uh, can have a really bad impact. And so once you check it, make sure it's accurate. And if it isn't, call those companies up and, and make sure that they clear it out. Uh, the other piece is just how they calculate that credit score because this is really key. The biggest piece is that uh, payment history. It's around 35% of that calculation. So Make sure if you have credit cards or, or bills, just pay them on time, maintain that credit history, and that will have a real impact on that credit score. And then of course, things like how much you owe is, is a big uh, impact as well. And then the length of credit history. So you never wanna open too many credit cards at once because it, it shows that there's low history in terms of those credit cards. And so, uh, you know, the, the three credit reporting agencies, uh, there's an authorized website, it's called annualcreditreport.com. That is, through the government, you go there and you can get those three credit reports every single year, um, you know, for the rest of your life. And so just, just pull it up, make sure it's accurate and uh, you're good to go. And then finally, the last one is just investing smart. So uh, by investing smart, I mean, take advantage of any single tax benefits you can. So if you work for a company, uh, a lot of the retirement benefits that you get have tax benefits uh, through them. You can get, uh, contributions tax-free. Uh, second is uh, when you're seeking any investments, make sure that you keep enough to last you a few months, especially in a market environment like this, where we may not know if our, our job's safe for the next six months. Make sure you keep ample amount of cash to get you through that time period. And then uh, start building a monthly budget. And then once you have that place in place, any money you have left over is what you can invest. And then when you're thinking of investments, uh, what I like to do is put it into three buckets. I think of it as short term, anything I need in less than a year, don't invest that, don't risk it, keep it safe um, and make sure that that's there when you need it. Medium term is one to three years. This means you can take a bit of risk and so you can use uh, diversified mutual funds or uh, ETFs, these are baskets of securities. Uh, and then long term, you know, longer than three years, you, know, you can afford to take more risk at the end of the day, like the stock market, 
uh, is a gamble. In fact, I was uh, talking to my sister the other day where it feels a little bit like a casino sometimes. You know, you can put some money in and, you know, the next day, 10% of it's gone. But over time, uh, it will generate strong returns. And that's, again, that generational wealth. And there's a lot of studies that say if you put $1,000 into the stock market in 50 years, that'll grow to fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000. And so that is that intergenerational wealth uh, that will last a lifetime. Uh, so a few good online platforms to start. Uh, there's a, a really good app called Acorns. Uh, it's a really good starting app for saving. Uh, essentially what it does is it, it rounds up a lot of your purchases that you do every day and it puts that into different investment vehicles. And so it's a, it's a good way to just start if you're, um, you know, if you're having trouble just getting uh, started on saving those extra, you know, pieces uh, of, of change or, you know, different types of um, spending that you have, you know, that's one good way to just track that. So, you know, I think those are the key takeaways. Um, you know, I think financial literacy to me means financial empowerment. And, you know, taking these steps uh, is just a, a good way to get started. And it really leads us to, to have that intergenerational wealth. So um, I'll just stop there and, uh, you know, we'll leave uh, the last, uh, last speaker, which is Evelyn. Thank you so much, Michael. We definitely need to keep things 700 and I, I appreciate that. <laughs> but I think financial literacy is so important and I, and I loved our conversation on our podcast. So I'm glad you referenced it. Uh, so if anyone's watching right now on Facebook and Zoom, feel free to comment as well if you have any questions or if you want more information about uh, Michael, his work and the great things that he has to say about financial literacy, you can tune into our podcast that we just released last week. It's on our uh, startfromgroundzero.com website. Uh, you just have to go to the podcast uh, section, and then he is probably the most updated podcast. So uh, he, he talked about a lot of great things and a lot of things that we can start incorporating in our life today uh, with getting our financial house in order. So I know I learned a great deal. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, continuing this conversation and utilizing your voice and expertise uh, within our community. So we do appreciate you. So coming up next, uh, this is our last speaker uh, for the evening, and I'm really excited about bringing her on. Uh, she's such a dynamic personality, a professional, and does some great work online and beyond. Um, but our, our next topic is uh, creativity from ground zero. Uh, and this will be spoken um, by uh, Evelyn from the Internet. And Evelyn is a speaker, humor, writer, and digital storyteller based in Austin, Texas. Add influencer if you want to send her free shea butter. She loves a good shea butter. Her, her YouTube uh, channel, Evelyn from the Internet, tackles everything from pop culture to politics, all with a comedic twist. Her first short film, Hello Tim, won the Excellence in Comedy Award at Toronto's 2019 Buffer Festival. And she co-hosted and wrote Say It Loud, a PBS Digital Studios show about Black histories and cultures. Please help me give a big warm welcome for Miss Evelyn from the Internet. Hey, 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 gotta do the Arsenio Hall. Ooh, 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 okay. <laughs> hey, everybody, thanks for hanging out with us on this Friday night. You ain't got nowhere else to be, um, but we still appreciate it. So yeah, I want to talk about fostering your creativity from ground zero. And my first, so I have three main points to go through. And my first one, and this is probably the biggest one, is that being creative is not the same as being artistic. I think that is a common misconception that a lot of people have, that artistic ability is tied to your creativity. When really artistic ability is just one facet of creativity or it's a result or a product of someone's creativity. Art, whether it's the culinary arts or, you know, um, they call it traditional media, things like painting, those are the ways that creativity is expressed. But creativity is a bit further back than the end product. And so to me, creativity is problem solving. And everybody here, every human on earth is a problem solver. Um, whether it's 
parents, parents are some of the biggest problem solvers I have ever met. You have to be creative to figure out, you know, how to get your kids to go to bed on time, how to, you know, eat their vegetables. Um, and when we reframe it like that, creativity as problem solving, we can take away some of those intimidating stereotypes and preconceived notions that we have about art, you know, because science is creative, you know, people build arms, like what the heck, like to, to be able to imagine the human body or to be able to imagine the human mind, you know, psychology and things like that. That is creative. Politics are creative, imagining a different society. And so um, my first tip about fostering your creativity from ground zero is to redefine or rather correctly define what creativity is. My second tip or you know thought concept is that input is way more valuable than output so think about it this way what is the first thing jimmy kimmel or you know jimmy fallon the jimmies what is the first thing they ask a musician in an interview who did you grow up listening to right so that is all input that's influence nobody you know drops from the sky and is beyonce not even beyonce you know what i mean so beyonce was influenced by tina turner you know the head banging rock and roll performance of it all you know the um you know the je ne sais quoi the stage presence and so that was all input even Tina Turner, who we view as an originator, was influenced by Rosetta Tharp, you know, a Black woman playing guitar, doing her thing in an industry where she was kind of the only one. And so Beyonce, whether it's Beyonce, Tina Turner, whether it's you and me, um, we have an entire lifetime of input. And that's brain food. You know, like your brain isn't just the things that you say, like you're not just the things you say, you're also the things you think. And so that's an important um, aspect of fostering your creativity is understanding that input is very valuable, more so than output. Especially because I think culturally in the United States anyway, we are an output based society. We want to like be productive during quarantine. You know what I'm saying? We want to like learn a new skill. Like who told you you had to learn anything? <laughs> like nothing is in the rule book. You don't have to do anything but show up. You don't have to put pants on if you don't want to. <laughs> so um, when I think about how that translates into creativity, it intimidates us because we equate creativity with an, a piece of output. So nobody wants to say they're a writer because they haven't published anything. But if you shift your focus from output to input, you'll see that it's really your love of reading that is what's most important. It's like the things you consume, the books you read that make you, that will make you a good writer. Nobody has ever learned to write without first knowing how to read, you know what I mean? And so um, I think it's just super important to understand that, especially like Rakima said, in you know this hyperproductive time to just slow down and practice some health and wellness to understand that it's a lot of internal work, not just your, your productive output. Um, and then even if we step away from from art right like writing and things like that and music we can go back to parenting or relationships so the relationships you saw growing up which is input directly affect the way you behave in your own relationships which is output and so all creativity is is doing something new with a set of tools or circumstances or experiences. It doesn't happen um, in a vacuum or it doesn't happen, you know, 
it's not like a blessing that kind of just drops out of nowhere. It's unique to every person and every person can access it for different things that they need. It also goes back to the whole, you know, growing up, if people call things ghetto and like, it's just resourceful, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like resourcefulness is a form of creativity. So that's number two. Number three, and again, shout out to Rakima for talking about this. Uh, my biggest tip is recess shouldn't end in fifth grade. <laughs> it should not end in elementary school. Play is super important. I, every, anybody who watches my YouTube channel knows that I'm a bubble kid. I love blowing bubbles. It kind of just like gives you a sense of delight and wonder, you know what I mean? And this is tied to our difficulty with play and recess is definitely tied to us being an output-based society. You know, things always have to have a point. And the point usually means profit. And that's not what creativity at the root is about. The end product can make you some money. There's nothing wrong with like having a job. Um, but creativity is play and play is an important part of being human and being you know free and when we look at all of the inequality in our society it's usually tied to who doesn't have time to chill you know like who doesn't have time to just let their mind wander and create art you know and so i think Everybody stuck at home right now making sourdough bread. I love it, you know, because nobody's trying to become a baker professionally. We're all just trying something out to see what it's like. You saw somebody with a with a sourdough starter. You're like, what the hell is a sourdough starter? So you know, you dive through YouTube and you just play around. Some people will hate the process, and some people will fall in love with baking bread as a hobby, you know? So trying something for the first time or playing around also releases your brain from being output focused. And that's when creativity happens. We all have experienced, you know, procrastinating or being stuck on a problem and it hits us when we're in the shower or it hits us when we're driving or when we're just, bullshitting and doing nothing in particular, you know what I mean? So um, people assume that creativity is lightning striking, but all it is is creating the conditions for that lightning to strike. So we all know that if you drive out to West Texas and it's flat, if there's a thunderstorm, that's dangerous, you know, that's how fires start. The lightning will strike, the conditions are conducive for the lightning to strike. But if you're in like a crowded place, it's not really gonna hit the same way. So creativity is, is doing all the work and play that it takes to create the right conditions for lightning to strike. So um, I feel like that's all I have. My biggest, uh, not my biggest, an example that I have of creativity is an engineer named Jessica Matthews she was visiting family in Nigeria and, you know, experienced the rolling blackouts. And then she also saw kids playing soccer. And she figured if I made a soccer ball, an energy generator that would, that would be kind of charged by getting kicked around, that, could, that soccer ball could light up their whole house. And that's what creativity is, it's solving problems using the set of experiences you're currently dealing with. Sometimes that ends up being, you know, a really cool invention. And sometimes it's just making sourdough at home. So um, that's what I have to say about creativity, starting it and fostering it from ground zero. Be gentle with yourself, be nice to yourself, and go forth and create. <laughs> Thank you so much, Evelyn. That was amazing. We really do appreciate you. I know many people loved it. People are commenting in Facebook as well. So thank you so much for contributing. So we are at officially at the end of our program and we want to make sure that we answer some of your questions. So I was uh, fielding some questions on Facebook. 
as well as looking in Zoom. But one question that we do have is for Rakima, and it's from Hermela Asafa. Rakima, how did you transform your childhood experiences to pinpoint your career interest or ultimate career choice as you started your journey out of college? Uh, that's a great question. So to keep it to keep it concise, um, I initially started off like similar to some other people mentioned. I started off biology pre dentistry. I'm first generation college, so my family was like, "You need to be doing something that they thought was going to be financially a good thing <laughs> um, and like look good socially." And um, I started off that way. I hated being in the labs. I cried in the labs with the goggles. I really wanted to be out interacting with people. So. Um, I switched my major secretly um, and then from there had to try to figure out how to navigate graduate school. Um, undergrad was tough for me academically just because of some of the emotional things that were undone from childhood. And so as an adult, like in college and in graduate school, I had to do my own self work, um, which was really important. So um, I did that. Um, and then pursued graduate school, you know, going through the steps of doing that. But I chose to do it because I wanted to be able to be a person that helped. I mean, it sounds super cliche, but it, it was a calling. Um, I had some other ideas about what my life might look like and some things that maybe would have looked more glamorous or, you know, to, to society. And it was just a calling. I was pulled to, to do this work because I, I felt like it was my responsibility since I did overcome the things that I experienced with little to no uh, mentorship or emotional support when it came to like a professional. Um, as a child, I was like, okay, I want to go and get trained to do this, to be able to help um, a child that they are resilient, they have it in them. Um, they don't have any, I'm not giving people anything when I work with them, I'm just helping them to be aware that they have it. So I'm giving them tools and awareness to show them that they have inside of them what they need to do what they want to do. Um, and so, yeah, it was more of a calling. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you so much. Uh, we're actually stick with you, Rakima, because there's a couple more questions that were asked. Uh, one person was asking, what is the best way to get in touch with you? And then the second person, and that was from Ruth Solomon. And then another person asked, uh, this was Emily Hodges uh, Verison. Uh, Rakima, do you have any black owned health and wellness businesses or products you can share with us? Yeah, so the first one is um, my website, uh, Centered Counseling Texas. Um, and then on Instagram, I'm Centered Texas. So if it's easier to find my uh, business Instagram, my website's linked on there. Um, so Centered Counseling and Consulting, um, you can send me a message through my website um, or you can send me an email at centeredcounselingtx at uh, gmail.com. Um, and then that's a great question. So yes, there's lots of different people. One thing to share as far as um, wellness in general, looking at stuff in your area, I'm not sure where you're located. I know that this is out to everybody, but um, here in Austin, there are a lot of great places um, and people. It's kind of hard to pinpoint, um, but if you reach out to me um, through my website, send me a message, I can direct you to some people in your area or send you some links to books and different things. Uh, it's kind of hard to think about them right now, but I'm happy to talk offline about that. So shoot me a message. Awesome, thank you so much. A uh, couple more questions uh, on our list. Uh, there's a couple that are geared towards Michael. So um, one is from Hike Ayala, and uh, this person said, how does student loan affect my credit? Uh, that's a really good question. So in, the, um, in that calculation, that's uh, done by this company called FICO, Fair Isaac Corporation. They basically come up with that credit score. Uh, they look at the amount of debt that you have, uh, but they distinguish between what's called revolving debt, which is like credit cards, and then student loan debt, which is, um, it's treated very differently. Uh, so I guess the short answer is, it affects it because of the level of debt, but it's a positive in that it's not what's called revolving uh, debt. So the interest rates on student loans are much lower. Uh, with credit cards, I mean, the annual rate can be 25, 30%. And so whenever I talk to folks about investing, I'm like, take care of that first, because you are not going to earn 25% in the stock market. Like, pay that off first. And then once you have that in order, uh, put the, uh, the rest into like investments. So 
uh, it impacts the score nate but it's not um it's not as negative as as credit card debt which can be detrimental yeah yeah thank you for that um the next question from you michael as well is from maxi harnett and uh, they are asking for any books or additional resources that you could recommend for investing. Yeah, there's, uh, I mean, there's a lot of different apps out there uh, that are just for beginners in terms of, um, you know, getting started with like a very small like account. So one that I've used in the past is called Robinhood. So it's actually a really simple app. Uh, allows you to you know move money from like a checking or savings into an investment account and uh, allows you to uh, invest that way. Uh, in terms of books and podcasts, um, that's something I can I can follow up directly with uh, with that person. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and last question, we're running a little over time, but just about five minutes, so we're doing really well. Uh, it's from Adriana Conway, and this came right from our Zoom room, and uh, I think this question we. Per uh, tailored towards Ralph, and, it, and they asked, um, any advice on reaching out to professional contacts that you haven't spoken to in a while? Uh, is it as awkward and off-putting as it seems? What has been your experience? Uh, I think that that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think one, definitely want to acknowledge that it definitely does feel awkward because so much time has passed. Um, I would definitely advise, because I've done it before as well, to just really take audit of that relationship first off, right? Um, so kind of like, did it end or not end necessarily, but like, are things kind of still in good standing? Um, and if so, then feel confident kind of reaching out. I would just be mindful about not just reaching out to kind of like make your ask like right off the cuff, but just kind of reach out just to genuinely, generally connect with them. Um, I also think that's why it's also really good just to kind of really manage your relationships as well, too, so that like, you know, you're just checking up on them on a continual basis, not necessarily when you need them, so that if and when you do need them, it doesn't seem as awkward or off-putting. Um, but yeah, I can speak for myself, too, that when people do reach out, like, I definitely understand that, like, people are looking for jobs or in different situations as well, too. So also kind of go in assuming good intent and know that people are really trying to help you as well, too. So um I wouldn't just expect that people would kind of feel bad or feel kind of like off-putted by you reaching out to them and needing something. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, so this concludes our program and I just want to really quick thank, um, first off, all of our speakers. I mean, from Rakima, Ralph, Evelyn, Michael, a performer, amazing performer, Maylot, um, Oin, uh, you guys were amazing and we do appreciate you spending your Friday night with all of us and contributing value to ways that we can build our way forward from Ground Zero. I uh, want to also thank our coffee company, uh, Ground Zero Coffee, for launching this event with my partner. Um, once again, it's an East African coffee home delivery company and podcast service that's focused on community impact through storytelling and social enterprise. So our goal is to utilize more of uh, more opportunities to really instill value into our community. So if you get a chance to check out our website at startfromgroundzero.com, you can find more information there. Follow us on social, on Facebook and Instagram at startfromgroundzero. Uh, also, if you are interested in continuing this amazing network with all of these uh, great people, uh, feel free to fill out the Ground Zero networking or network um, uh, form that's on our website and at startfromgroundzero.com slash summit. That's S-U-M-M-I-T. So you would go to, that, uh, go to that page, scroll down, and then just fill out your name and maybe the particular interest uh, that you have with what was spoken about today. So you can fill out financial literacy, you can fill out health and wellness, uh, creativity, branding, and so forth, because we would like to get to know you a little better in ways that we can best serve you beyond this event. So feel free to stay in touch, stay connected. Uh, we are growing through this process together. Uh, this is our first of many events, still have a lot to learn, so we appreciate any great feedback from all of you that have tuned in. Also, please be sure to follow up with all of our speakers with the great things that they mentioned. Again, they are contributing so much value to us, uh, so make sure you reach out to them and just share your appreciation for the work and uh, the voice that they're contributing to this event. Um, following up is crucial. You know, Ralph spoke about that, so uh, this is a good place to start, you know, with following up. So. Uh, stay connected, y'all. Uh, this has been an amazing event. Once again, thank you guys so much uh, for uh, this, our first official Start From Ground Zero event. Stay connected, and we will see all of y'all soon. So, 
have a great evening.